Good evening, everyone. Rada, are we recording? Yes. Okay. Welcome to our second study session, or sorry, second community workshop on the multifamily objective design and development standards. I'm Brittany Bendix, the town's town planner. Um, I do want to take care of some housekeeping and just in terms of the schedule uh, for tonight and other meetings moving forward. Our last workshop was on October 23rd, and I do recognize some faces in the room. Uh, we then had a study session with our planning commissioners and our city council members on November 1st. That led to a very robust conversation, and the study session was ultimately continued to November 27th at 3 p.m. Uh, that's the Monday after Thanksgiving. So that reframed what we're planning, what we were planning to do tonight, just a little bit, because we don't really have any direct feedback from the council members and the planning commissioners at this point. So what we're planning to do tonight is to revisit the content from workshop number one, um, go over many of the slides that we shared at that presentation, but then also dig into a little deeper on some of those concepts like FAR and lot coverage. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Tom Ford with M Group, who will lead us through tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Good evening. Uh, let me just augment a little bit about what Brittany just said. It's not like we, we're just going to come here and just give you a review of what we did at the at the study session number one, I mean, at the workshop number one. What we really wanted to do was explore um, that big house idea and see if it can fit with the number of dwelling units on a one acre parcel. So we've done a little bit of um, modeling, if you will, and we'll take you through that and then circle back to some of those same design issues that we talked about at workshop number one and um, at the planning commission's uh, city council study session. So next. So are you gonna do this or do you want me to do something? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so the agenda for tonight is uh, Brittany kind of just gave an update on the schedule. And I think the, the big piece to hit on for what she said is that we thought we'd be coming after the study session, but we're actually happening in the middle of it because it started, had a really nice discussion, but it's been continued. So the rest of the uh, study session will happen after tonight's meeting. So we hope if anybody's got something to say, we'll write it down and we'll report to the continued study session of new ideas that we hear or uh, reiterated ideas that we hear. So what I wanted to do is then just review with you again, the regulatory tools. And I'm not doing that to bore people who were here for both of the previous meetings, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we've actually put um, a Ravenswood site as, as our model, if you will. Um, one of the people commented at the workshop number one that it wasn't a real site and Atherton sites aren't like that. So we thought, well, let's just go look at one of the sites that's being studied as part of the CEQA process and use that as our one acre site. It turns out it's actually 1.1 acres. So that's what we're doing. Um, then I just wanna make sure um, you know that we heard some of the comments that we heard from you at workshop number one. So we'll talk about that. We'll remind you what we mean by the large house typology. And then we'll go ahead and start dealing with some of those site development ideas on that large site. I'm hoping I can get through that fairly quickly, just so that the big part is discussion, which means if you have a comment, you can put it into the microphone, we'll record it and we'll be able to move forward. And then we have one last slide, which basically is a written version of what Brittany's already told you. The next meeting is November 27th. Uh, next, we'll, we can do that. So why are we doing this again? Um, it's to respond to the, the, the issues that were raised in the draft housing element or the adopted housing element, I guess, and which is still has not been certified by HCD, but it has been sent and so we're making changes. Uh, we're trying to facilitate multifamily housing within the town. And um, we're hoping, and I think we've been hearing a lot of good discussion along those lines, that the standards that we're going to develop for this new piece of the zoning ordinance will reflect 
um, the character of Atherton um, to the degree we can with a new development typology. So just again, a little overview, objective standards. A lot of this is coming from state legislation that's been passed basically at the state level. Looks basically all communities are the same. They all have to respond to these laws. So what the objective, the objective design standards do is offer us an opportunity to sort of bridge the gap between the mandates in the state legislation and the desire to have a community character that's reflective of local decisions and local uh, design and, and uh, neighborhood characteristics. What we'll be developing are standards that use a variety of strategies to be objective, whether it's just saying the height limit is 22 feet, or if it's saying the roof can be no steeper than six feet in, or six feet in 18 feet or something like that, put a ratio, a number of different ways that you can assure objectivity and there's no wiggle room, there's no place for confusion. Uh, the developer has a surety at the beginning because everything's transparent. The community has um, some level of assurance too because they have the zoning code that will be adopted eventually by the council. So again, what we envision, I, I showed this last time, what we envision happening is you open your zoning ordinance, you have a whole bunch of different zoning districts. Well, you don't have a whole bunch, you have a few. And um, uh, what we'll be de developing is a new, a new section of your zoning ordinance. It'll be called, um, it'll be directed at RM10, which is one of the uh, designations called out for in the housing element. Uh, we're gonna talk about RM10 tonight, but there'll also be two other uh, new development, a uh, new code sections, one for RM20 and one for RM40. And the 10, the number refers to how many dwelling units per acre the standards are meaning to enforce. So um, the, the housing element points out that there's a series of um, sites that have been uh, identified for RM10. Well, the housing element identifies one site and that was later expanded for CEQA review to a series of sites by the council to look at for 10 dwelling units per acre. Uh, so here it is uh, in the housing element, they talk about residential sites, RM10. Uh, the housing element presently says that those have a height limit of up to 40 feet. Um, that was um, discussed a, a fair amount by planning commissioners and council members at the study session. So I think it'll probably be revisited when they can uh, continue their session on November 27th. So like I said, we're only gonna be really talking about the left side tonight. Again, we wanted to uh, do some testing, if you will, of the large house typology and see how it fits on a one acre or approximately one acre Atherton site. So just to remind you, um, here's the actual site. It's not that we drew it wrong. It's just, act, it's an actual site on Ravenswood. It's a little bit longer on the, on the Northwest, if you will, North being up in this image. Um, and it's a little bit shorter on the bottom. So it looks like out of square, but it's just the way the parcel lays out, um, in GIS and Ravenswood in this case has a center line. It has some um, bike lanes and such. And so we've tried to reflect that. So this is a replication of the actual house that sits on that parcel today. This is us just drawing from Google Earth and looking at it, looking at the roof and the proximate footprint. So you can see um, it's relatively in the middle or the center of the site, a lot of room around it. What these images actually obviously don't show is um, existing foliage, existing trees, existing uh, canopy and tree cover. So take that Ravenswood site, um, apply the R1A setbacks, and you have the front and rear setbacks shown on this image. You'll remember this hopefully from our last time if you were here. That gives you the dark green, which is what I'm calling developable area. 
because except for accessory buildings, you can't develop in the setbacks. Um, using, oh, and the reason we're doing this is there was a lot of um, response last time that people really wanted us to try to make multifamily housing on these RM10 sites conform to the degree possible with the R1A standards, setbacks, there is no coverage standard, but heights, um, FAR and such. So right now I'm just using that site and showing you some of the parameters. So here's um, the height limit for an R1A site on the Ravenswood site. And as I, I say this, every time I show this site, your zoning code for R1A is a little bit more complicated than this. If there's ways to get a little bit taller height on a parcel, if you give uh, more of a setback. So depending on what the setback becomes, there's a chance that this could be taller, but generally speaking, this is where the R1A zoning ordinance starts. So I have to be on that. Okay. Um, so again, one of the things that uh, we use as a tool is FAR. So this is, FAR is just the ratio of the square footage of the building to the square footage of the parcel, the piece of land. So this is 1.0 and it's not a building, it's just FAR. It's like how much you can do, how much square footage you can put on your site. 1.0 on a two-story situation would be like this. You can't cover the whole site. You could still just do two stories, half the site or three stories. Um, the building would have to be um, much less coverage, if you will. Um, and then coverage, coverage is another issue. You presently don't have any coverage standards in your R1A, but you do have coverage standards and other uses like um, public open space and the PFS properties have a, a site coverage um, stipulation. So it's just a tool we can use if we want to, to add uh, dimension to the standards that we'll be writing talking about how much of the site could be covered. So this is 75%, obviously three quarters of the site can have a building or pavement on it. Buildings, outbuildings, decks, asphalt, that's usually all covered as part of coverage. Here's 25%. So this was the um, set of um, design issues that we took through the, that we sort of led you through with the uh, workshop number one, and we wanted to talk about these issues. And as I said earlier, there's a lot of a lot of you that were here and others that aren't here tonight commented on the setback height and the building and height and the massing, um, trying to the degree possible to match the R1A. And we told the council and planning commission that as such at the study session. So I want you to think about those as we continue on. And then if you'll recall, we showed these large house typologies and when one of the counts, uh, one of the planning commissioners is not here tonight, but he brought to our attention, you know, this is a type of construction that happened at a different era in American development. So this kind of architecture isn't generally seen uh, in a mass produced product um, these days, um, but you might have one of these styles implemented really nicely for a single family home in Atherton. But generally speaking, when you get into this four units, eight units per building, it's not a style. So we had a little bit of a discussion or, or at least uh, put out there for the planning commission and the council to think about the fact that this probably wouldn't be the architecture that would be done. So what are some of the design standards we can put into the ordinance if there's some element here like a porch, a window ratio, a window trim, um, dormers, things like that, are there things that we want to see, especially on the public facing facades of the buildings? So, no. here's just um, a few issues. So aesthetics, I mentioned before, one of the planning commissioners brought up that issue of style, architectural style. Um, architectural style is a really hard thing to write objective standards for, but you can get into things like 
how much transparency via windows happens on a front facade, on a back facade, on all, you know, all the facades. So long as there's a way to describe it, it can be objective and we can try to enforce aesthetics. Um, there might be some description of the depth of the window plane glass from the facade, you know, the deeper so that it casts a shadow. That's a, a pretty rich design detail that there's a way to write to. The also, also what was spoken a lot about at workshop number one that we reported to the council and planning commission was the issue of privacy, um, especially not just with being in the setback area or the open area, but being on the second floor or being on the ground and, a, and the new development has an upper floor that can see into um, an adjoining parcel. So that in addition to noise, and methods for screening, create using landscaping, walls, and other um, tools to screen between developments. Um, heritage trees was brought up by a few people. Um, it's one of the things that marks the community. You have a pretty nice heritage tree ordinance. You have tree cover, you have foliage, you have a tree canopy um, on a lot of these existing sites. And like I said, our modeling doesn't show it but it's an existing feature of many of those sites, especially when you get towards the property line at the sides, um, there's a lot of existing trees and foliage that create um, sort of a buffer right now, and they create sort of a characteristic or character for Atherton. Uh, traffic, both vehicular and uh, safety for pedestrians and bicycles, that was brought up at the first workshop, if you'll recall, and we assured the, um, Planning Commission and the City Council that that's one of the aspects that's being studied right now in the CEQA process that's going on for uh, the sites that we're studying. And then the final issue, or the, one of the final issues that we spoke about to the Council was parking. Not only um, where it is on the site, but is it open? Is it in a structure? Is it, um, a, what's the difference between the people who live there, the parking for the development and the parking for the guests and how, how might it be handled differently. So I know parking is um, a big concern, not just for the traffic component, but for an aesthetic component. So now we're getting to the part that we wanted to do for this workshop. We, re we really were curious to see if you could get 10 units in a, in a feasible way that met some of those comments that we heard, 10 units on a one acre site. So we decided it, it, we would do what we're calling a development yield study. So I'm going to show you a number of images that are really about floor area ratio. They're about development yield. They're not architectural designs. Think of them as Lego blocks. And just like you can't bend a Lego block, but you could say, this is my house, this is Brittany's house, and you can put them, assemble them on a map, and you can represent it and say, oh, there's three houses, that's 3,000 square feet. That's pretty much the, the, the vein of our study here. And so I'm going to say this a number of times, this is not architectural design, but it leads us, it can lead us to thinking about some architectural design issues, like, okay, if you're going to put three of those Lego blocks there, there's gotta be some relief. There's gotta be something that happens to adjust the mass of a building. Maybe it's not all one building. Maybe it's in multiple buildings on the site. So um, after we go through this series of model of you know, development yield models, we'll um, also be touching on multifam multifamily design issues. We're trying to fit it into the SR1 or the R1A um, development standards, setbacks, height and such. And you'll see that we were successful, except for FAR. So um, uh, we'll go through those, but we'll think of it, and I want you to think of it as you're watching the, car, the uh, series of slides in the context of multifamily development. And then we'll break, we'll stop, I'll stop, and we'll let you give us some of your input, feedback, questions, um, or ideas for what some of the design cues we can be thinking about as we develop objective standards for the new zoning ordinance. So again, 
we're using the black lettering, the dark lettering, we're using those from the R1A standards. And it's these orange ones that I really want you to think of as I show you the slides, which are not architecture, right? They're massing, they're just think of them as Lego blocks. They're not designed, but we have to write the design code that implements that. So just keep that in mind. So what we started with, and here they, we put two of these on a um, on a, the Ravenswood site that we've been looking at, is we put a couple of different shapes of blocks. They're 10 feet high, which is approximately what a floor to floor um, height would be for a multifamily development. Um, and they all equal a thousand square feet, which is on average what a multifamily unit would be. You're gonna have studios, apartments down at four, 500, 600 square feet. You're gonna have two bedroom apartments, three bedroom apartments up at 1300 square feet. So we had to just find a range. So we went with just using a thousand square feet. When I say gross square feet, I mean that this block represents, if you stack two of them on top of each other, it represents the stairway. It represents the walls. It represents the bathrooms. It represents the common areas. But it's just, uh, again, just a tool that we could use to at least start getting these blocks, if you will, on the model. So what we've done then is taken them and put them in different configurations, both horizontally and vertically, and started to look at how can we get 10 dwelling units per acre base, but maybe somebody applies for the density bonus and they can get more than that. So in each of these models, you're gonna actually see the potential for the square footage represented by 13 dwelling units, 13,000 square feet. We put in different configurations within the setbacks and as it turns out, within the height. 15. What? 15. Mm. I'll get there. That's just showing you the blocks. We, we, that's not a development yet. That's not a model. That's just showing we're gonna use them in different configurations. I'm sorry, sorry for that confusion. So he brings up a really good point. This is not a scenario. This is just how we... No. I'm going to be showing you 13 in a series of models. I didn't even count these, but you say there's 15. You're right. That's That's somebody who got a lot of density bonus. No, and we wouldn't want this on the site anyway. I'm just saying that in different parts of the site, hopefully within the setbacks, we started to use these blocks to build different models. And that's where you'll see the 13,000. Uh, 13, so here's the first one. Up on the upper left is the R1A standards that you have. And I, as I said, you don't presently have a coverage standard in your residential development, but we've tracked it. So here's just taking, thir here's 13 blocks. So here's taking 13 blocks, just stacking them up. Again, this is not architecture. We're not saying this is a big, long, uh, 180 foot long front facade. We're just saying that in the developable, in the developable area, which is represented by the dark green, and within the height limit, that you presently have for your R1A, we can have a three-story building here, three-story and two-story. Um, again, an architect's gonna come in here and they're gonna have four studios and five two bedrooms and three one bedrooms and then a, a three bedroom to match. So they're gonna mix that. And once they start mixing that development typology, the building can do certain things like not present such a blocked frontage, but it can start to, um, the architecture. The purpose of what we're trying to do here is just show potential development yield and does it fit. And what we have here, um, I forgot to mention earlier that in your R1A, you have an 18% maximum FAR and we're showing 30% here, or 0.3. So um, in terms of meeting the R1A standards, 13,000 square feet cannot fit the FAR standard, but the rest of them, it can fit. So um, floor area ratio, that's the, the ratio between the amount of your building, square feet, 
to the square foot of your parcel. So, so, um, so again, I'm going to show you another image. This is the same model, not using architecture yet, but starting to show that I did something wrong. Starting to show a little bit of a roof, um, a little bit of a dormer situation so that perhaps instead of being 10 feet high, the interior of the building on that third floor could still be 10 feet high, but maybe on the outside, it can be a little bit lower. This is a concept I talked about with one of your um, planning commissioners after the study session, he came up and was asking some questions. So again, it's not architecture, but what we're trying to show is you take those 13 blocks of a thousand square feet each and you start to manipulate them um, with uh, dormers and situations on the roof that can start to help make it not so blocky, but break down the mass. And then we've started to show, you know, maybe where some of the entries might be. So you could see on this big house model, the large house, there might be multiple entries. There could be entries to the side that still find their way to the street. And so I have four models. We're on the first one here, and each of them are in three parts. First is that just showing the blocks. Second is here. And then the third is um, adding um, garages and a little bit of um, how you would get to the garage in terms of the asphalt that that would require. The garage in this case is actually in the setback, but that's allowed in Atherton. You can be as close as 10 feet to a property line in an, in an R1 if it's an accessory building. And then we're showing multiple entries to the street. So this is just something to think about. Again, we're gonna circle back and let you talk about these in the terms of design issues. Like I don't want three entries on the street or something like that. But again, you'll see that we're within the height limit of an R1, we're within the setbacks. And um, the only thing that we're missing is the, um, the FAR. Oh, and then here's a page from your R1 zoning ordinance. So you'll know if, for those of you that are familiar with the R1 zoning ordinance, there's a discussion in there that's graphically supported that talks about rules for developing a dormer. This is in the middle, you have a shed dormer. And um, again, what it allows is it allows that upper floor to be a full floor but it doesn't look like a full floor. It just looks like part of the roof that's been given a little bit of character and um, you know, personal attention rather than just looking at a, sh a, a field of shingles, you're looking at you know, windows and more um, architectural design. So again, these are all taken from the, um, the R1A, but you'll notice that they, there's ways, these are all objective. More than 50% of total, no more than 50% of the total frontage length may be for the dormer and it shows how the frontage length is measured. It shows what the dormer can be and such. Um, over on the right, you know, the, the, the uh, dormer, the, the, the um, E, the, not the E, the peak of the dormer can be no closer than two feet. It has to be at least two feet lower than the main uh, peak. So there's all kinds of rules that you're already using in your single family context that we can, um, start to think about if we want to. So here's another model. Again, 13 blocks, 13,000 square feet. Um, it takes an L-shaped configuration. It still is able to fit in that developable area that's left when you um, put the setbacks on, the side, rear, and front setbacks. You could still fit 13,000 square feet in this configuration. Again, it's not architecture. All these blocks are the same size. An architect can find a way to adjust the mass, adjust the front edges, adjust the maximum uh, linear feet before you have to do something to break that um, plane. Uh, and those are all rules that we can write as part of the zoning ordinance, the objective design standards. So this is just the blocks. Here's giving it a little bit of architecture. Again, trying to employ um, the dormers on the top floor to, um, to give it a little bit of more architectural relief, um, still give it a full floor. 
and you'll see that we have smaller dormers on the front and the shed dormer to the rear. Um, so just different kinds of dormers can achieve different things and uh, represent different kinds of um, uh, disposal of the space, if you will. So I could see that those two little dormers in the front could be bedrooms and the larger one at the back could be kitchen, living room, uh, some of the public space, public interior public space of a, of a dwelling unit. Again, showing a little bit of a front entry and a little bit of a side entry. So we've taken both approaches on this one. Still can't make the uh, FAR. Again, here's how it might look with, um, you know, coming out to um, the pedestrian entries, touching the street, the asphalt, touching the garage, uh, 13 parking spaces, and um, what's still to be decided is where do the guests park? Yes. That's a good point. It didn't change much, but it should have. So this would be more like 3.32 or 0.35 or something. That's a good point. Thank you. Sorry. Coverage or okay. just a point three oh, oh, coverage. Well, actually both, but yeah, the coverage would change a little bit, but uh, so would the FAR. So, and the FAR uh, for an accessory building would, would needs to count too. Unless the accessory building is an ADU, then there's a whole series of state laws that affect those. Yeah, 15 feet. 15? 15 feet. Unless it's an ADU, and that you might be able to get a different height. Good catch on the on the coverage. I didn't think of that. Okay, here's a third uh, large house typology that we talked about at the other workshop, and it's called a courtyard typology. So the the wings of the building actually try to form um, a nice little courtyard space, and you might have stairways up and um, in different ways. So it animates the space, and, and not everybody's just using one entrance like a, a large apartment building might but you have multiple entries and sometimes they can activate that courtyard. So right now we have two versions. It's basically the same building, but we flipped it We're, because we want to hear from you. Here's the courtyard facing the rear parcel line. And then in a little while, I'll show you a different one. This is going to have the same, when we get to the garage, it's gonna have the same coverage and FAR issue that you identified in the previous one. So here again, you can start to imagine if you could start to put dormers and such to manipulate that, that roof plane, that third floor here. Um, you'll see that the two side wings are only two stories. Those are just attic space. Those aren't development units above the, um, the, the Lego blocks, if you will. And so you have this with a couple of entries towards the front. And then this would also have, as I said, entries in that courtyard space. You just don't see them that well here, but you'll see them on the next model. So here you can see there's a little bit of um, a delineated wall here, a small wall, you know, three feet high to, to just mark this off as a sort of a semi-private courtyard for the use of the residents. Um, their garages are back here, the entries to, for the vehicular entry, and then some, some uh, residential entries to the street off the front of the building. So here's the same building basically, but flipping it around. And I really wanna hear what you think about this. Um, allowing that courtyard to animate the public realm, the, the street. So when somebody's coming by, they see this courtyard. Um, and so you have build people able to enter their units from the ground plane, or they might go into the courtyard and go upstairs. So here again, this is at the same building, even the same roof, but you start to see where we put that courtyard there um, in the front. So you might step up into it. So you're off the street level by, by a, a foot or two, get up a little bit, gives it a little bit of semi-privacy. And then um, we didn't put stairways, but you could animate this courtyard with stairways 
that would um, go to the upper level units and such. Um, starts to get a little crowded there and back between the building and the garage. But again, the garage could move closer to the rear pro property line if it needed to. It can be as close as 10 feet. So those are our models. I'm happy to go back and look through any of them, but what we wanted to do now is take comments. And you can talk about anything you want to talk about, but here's some things that we just laid out for you a little bit to to um, to maybe get your, your juices started. And you want people to speak into the microphone? Yeah. So if you have a comment, it would be great if you could, because we're recording the meeting, it would be great if you could um, just... Uh, speak right into the microphone. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, Woodson Martin and uh, this is my wife Kelly, and we live adjacent to the Ravenswood properties. Um, the first is a question, which is what consideration might have been given in thinking through design standards uh, about the potential for consolidation of lots? I think you're basically painting one of the one acre or one plus acre lots there, there are three adjacent. And uh, if a developer were to, uh, you know, buy them all or try to develop all three in parallel, how would that potentially be factored? It hasn't been thought through at all, I guess my question. We've thought about it. I wouldn't say we've thought through, but we've certainly, can I show that image? Okay. We've, um, we've been thinking about it. It's kind of an odd configuration, but I agree with you, it could potentially happen. So here's the three existing houses as they were, as they are today. And then here's the land. So again, just trying to put the um, the front, the side setback. So obviously you wouldn't have a side setback on those two interior parcel line configurations, but you'd still have, if you want to try to adhere to the R1, you'd have the same side setback and you'd have the rear and the front. Um, so clearly it's an odd shape. So I think if you've got comments, it would be great to hear them. Um, obviously, for, to my benefit, to my way of thinking, I think it points towards multiple buildings, not trying to do one building that's just a, a long, massive bar. So I think, um, and I think there's an advantage to doing multiple buildings because you create community space between the buildings. You, you keep the scale down. You're not trying to do let's say we've been showing 13 units on one acre. So this would be, could potentially be 39 maybe. So 39 dwelling units, I think it would look more uh, fitting into the neighborhood if it were multiple buildings, but that's just my idea. Um, it'd be great if you have ideas, but it sounds like you thought of uh, aggregating the parcels <laughs> or that it could potentially happen, but. I mean, my comment would be, I'd like to see the design standards avoid an, an, a massive block uh, in the design. And so I guess that would be about limiting the length of a front that or something of a, of a structure, right? But I think that would be part of the um, consideration, I guess. I don't have any other comment right now, but she does. <laughs> Looking at the courtyard models and thinking about these particular parcels. I don't know if it would be true, the other ones under consideration, but uh, for privacy and noise, th having the common areas on the Ravenswood side rather than on the back where the other neighbors are um, adjoining, I think would maybe make sense um, because we don't want to shove the noise and the activity back against the properties adjoining. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. And then the other thing I'd like to say is I think all of the proposed uh, parcels are perimeter parcels on the town. Basically, they face other commercial or multifamily or school areas. And so I think it's worth, as we think about things like setbacks and the this common area question, what are we optimizing for? And is it protecting the property, the adjacent properties that are not so zoned? Or is it about somehow protecting 
the street front, um, you know, and I think as an adjacent property, I think we'd rather push those things toward the street and leave as much space and screening and trees and walls, whatever, you know, between the development and the property boundaries. And so I think that's true of all the proposed properties are perimeter. And so maybe front setbacks are the first thing we'd sacrifice if we were trying to, as opposed to rear setbacks. And then I would think about that in terms of the accessory structures and those limits, the 10 foot limit on the back, right? So in this case, maybe we want a bigger setback in the back um, for that same reason. So that's a thought. Tom Georgie with Stephanie Sargent. We live at 425 East Oakwood Boulevard and uh, we live immediately adjacent to 23 Oakwood, which is actually the only site that is currently on the element. Uh, Ravenswood and Baywood, those are just uh, on there for CEQA analysis. But Oakwood is surrounded by uh, six other parcels, touch it. So it's a long, narrow rectangle. And there's no shifting of setbacks that can minimize the um, massive impact of, of the neighbors. So when you're hemmed in on all sides, I don't think you can shift the borders to solve for any of that. And it's a little disturbing tonight to hear that uh, accessory dwelling units don't count in coverage or in well like a driveway can be I mean you're talking about or, I'm sorry a, uh, a garage and we're talking uh, RM10 on 1.62 acres 1.52 but 1.62 if it surveys that way we're talking I've seen 1922 units based on the bonus density law. So you're talking 22 car garage. It can be 10 feet from a fence. Um, I just, there's, there's no rejiggering this that can really deal with that. So my takeaway is that uh, for the sake of the neighbors, if you're doing objective design standards, I think number one should be underground parking. And that's a full stop on that. I just, I don't know how you could fit that many cars and that many units onto that narrow of a lot and not have that accessory buildings just jammed right up against the fence. Can I follow up with a question um, relative to if it's not underground parking, could it be tucked under parking where the ground level would then accommodate parking? Uh, and so- Can you explain it, that? Uh, what? That sure. So when I, when I call it tucked parking, I mean that the parking is above grade and it's effectively the first level of the building and that you have the units stacked on top so that the ground level is effectively parking or an ancillary uses. I, my gut reaction is that that would raise the building and make it more visible from my yard, mm -hmm. which is not optimal. Okay. Um, our goal, if this is going, if I, I just, Again, I always go back to, I can't fathom how 23 Oakwood was cited outside mm -hmm. of a personal favor. I don't think it should be considered at all. I think that in the uh, resubmittal that hopefully council comes to their senses and removes it as a site for consideration for multifamily or any other special zoning consideration. And that's our hope. But if they do ram this through, um, that that they would do so with consideration of the neighbors. And I, we don't want to see the building. We don't want to hear the traffic from it. Um, we want the peaceful, quiet enjoyment of our home. So that means we don't want to see it and we don't want to hear it. So um, I would, I would if, if it were up to me, which it's obviously not, I, I would absolutely not be amenable to tucked in parking 
I would insist on underground parking. In fact, I would do everything I could to discourage development of multifamily sites that you're going to put on the element with draconian standards. And I would make it as difficult as possible for this to pencil for a developer. That's what my input is. Anyway. Would anybody else like to have a comment? I feel like this is maybe something I should think through myself, but it does occur to me like the what do you call the um, t house big large house typology like the concept. Um, however, it is different to have a family living in a large house next door, looking out their windows into my backyard, as opposed to however many dozens of people living in this building looking out how many or many windows into our backyard. So the privacy thing is really going to affect the neighboring properties. And so thinking about windows screening. Um, to your comment on draconian standards so that no multifamily can be built. Obviously, HCD will never buy that. So the standards, while they have to be objective, and objective standards relative to what's being shown here is going to cause a problem for 23 Oakwood, just that particular site. But the, if the standards are too draconian, HCD will deny it and will continue to sit and wait for a Builders Remedy Project, which will bring everybody to their senses and realize we have to do something to comply with the state. Maybe this initiative that's being pushed will pass, but I believe that'll be fought in the courts by the state for years. So there's going to be multifamily in, in Atherton, I believe. Could you explain the density bonus? I mean, are we talking, how many units are we actually talking about? So that's one of the reasons that the study session was continued so that we can go back and provide more information relative to the density bonus, because the reality is there's so many factors that go into giving you precise numbers. And we haven't even made decisions as a town yet on some of the variables that uh, impact those numbers. So for example, the number of, or the percentage of affordable units that a project has to provide, the income levels that a, the affordable units then have to be provided at. Um, sometimes there are even factors in to the, the population that the affordable housing is serving. Is it for students? Is it for seniors? Um, so we're really trying to focus just on the objective development and design standards at this point and not get too caught up in density bonus because it is this really open-ended thing. There's, And then there's a topic relative to how close is it to public transit. Um, and so that's one of the things that we'll be coming back to the study session with greater information on. Relative to that point, um, the... What are the requirements for parking for things that are considered within reasonable, you know, distance of public transit and or I guess shopping or the other factors? Is are are the Ravenswood properties required to have a specific amount of parking to be developed? Well, right now you don't have a parking ordinance, so there's no standard. So we're writing it. Typically, what happens with multifamily um, development? depending on how close it is to community amenities like shopping, schools, transit. Um, it can be anywhere from one parking space per bedroom to one parking space per dwelling unit or 1.5 per dwelling unit. So that tends to be where it is, where it, where it lands as a minimum. And then usually multifamily development requires approximately 0.25 guest parking spaces per dwelling unit. So if you have four units, 
you have to have at least one guest unit. And in Atherton, this means off street, right? You don't have on street parking. So the whatever the parking standards end up being for all of the dwelling units and the guest parking, it needs to be accommodated somewhere on the site. Obviously with underground parking, it's very expensive and that would be the first thing that a developer would sidestep in the bonus density law. But if that's one bullet spent, then I guess from my perspective that, that at least that keeps them from putting a bunch of windows on the second floor that look into my my home. So I would still advocate for underground parking. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, we'll bring the mic to you. We're because we're recording. I'm I'm assuming that um you I appreciate you were exploring this um this kind of um development and um it would be really helpful, I think, to um, find additional examples when, you know, when I think about properties and I think it's good to borrow from other cities because they've done it. Um, and I'm not saying that any of these projects in particular apply to any of these, but they could. Um, I think about screening, for example, and I think about, you um, Minalto in Menlo Park, close to um, where there's actually an apartment building behind. And, you know, when you talk about um, densities and building extra units, you're turning these bigger structures basically into, it's a condo. It is, that's what it is. And so they have, um, you know, beautiful coverage behind some of them. It's not ideal, but it does exist. You go to the properties over by in Menlo Park, again, behind Burgess that were developed, I think 20 years ago, and they have off street parking. Um, it is ground level, but they are, you know, within the structure. Um, and there's, you know, there's a nice architectural design to those, those different homes. Um, when you go underground, it, it is expensive, but it could be ideal as well. Um, you know, it brings in a lot of other things too, soils and all those things, and it depends on what the site is. But I remember in the last meeting, there was um, a statement, I think it was the fourth or fifth objective, and to your point, um, they, it has to, there has to be a solution that would work for development and the builder because you do have things that have to be done. And so um, I love that this session is the second half of exploring something that fits into an area that has these setbacks but there are other places in Atherton, you know, on Selby, there's a list of addresses of homes that are across the street from mansions that have smaller setbacks and those homes are valuable and um, they're not the mansions across the street, but they're, they're beautiful homes. Um, and there's a lot of them. And um, I think it would be, great for discussion to explore all those because um, as narrow as this is and specific as it is, there's lots of other options. And I would hope that we're going to look at those different ones because look, ultimately I think people want, um, they want the enjoyment of their property, whoever that is, the neighbors and the neighborhood. But there's also concern of values. 
I mean, people wonder how this is going to affect, you know, our neighborhood. The gentleman who spoke last week talked about what that would do to his property. And lots of people have personal, you know, concern about that. And so, you know, we're moving around a lot of puzzle pieces. And I think it is important to take time. But I think it's important to look at a lot of different examples as well that are viable and valuable. Ultimately, people have agendas, and that's fine. Um, but it's it's important to look at them. And at the end of the day, we have to build them. So what happens if we don't build them? One of the councilmen said last week, you know, not doing anything is is a plan. But that's not a good plan. And the last thing you want is the state to come in and mandate you do certain things. If you make it too difficult for a builder, then a builder is going to build the kind of properties where they're gonna to try to maximize and build something that could even be even more impactful. So just generally speaking, it would be great to look at lots of other things. And I don't know if those are done formally here or if they're done through email so that you can then come back and share. Um, it's a lot of work to do, but it's really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Some of the drawings uh, of the dormers in particular sparked a thought um, and it goes, I have no idea if this would help with the Oakwood property because I'm not unfamiliar with it. So apologies, but um, you know, you were talking about maybe bedrooms on the front, with small dormers, maybe bigger spit public spaces on the back with the big windows. And just as a homeowner out the back window, I would say, is there anything we can do in the standards that would turn that around, mm -hmm. right? Where the big open windows, the larger windows, for example, like face the street or the public domain and not the private domain of a neighbor. And I don't know how that would happen. I don't know how these things work, but that would be a preference uh, on my mind. It might be easier to pull off. I completely understand what you're saying. And I wasn't trying to advocate that the public space should go towards the back. I was just saying you could almost look at the dormers and understand that, you know, that's somebody's bedroom. That's not. Um, so it's almost like something that would be easier to enforce through an incentive, but we're actually working on objective standards up in Woodside right now. And some of the parcels are near 280. And so we're trying, which is pretty loud. And so we're trying to find a way to orient the interior architecture. So like when you're awake, those rooms are maybe in their case towards 280 and where you sleep is on the other side. So we're exploring that right now. I'm not trying, I'm not able to find a way yet to do it objectively, but there could be a way through an incentive or something, but it's worth exploring, I think. I mean, could an objective standard express a different rule for properties that face the street than, pro or, sorry, for a facade that faces the street than the facade that faces other neighbors? Right. And it will. Okay. But that's usually a development or design standard for what that outside wall looks like. Now, maybe you write it in such a way that the developer's hands are tied and they can obviously only put a bedroom there. You know, like if you said the dormers can only be like a bedroom or only smaller windows or yeah. something of that nature. But that, yeah, you can definitely do that, but you can't necessarily by that guarantee what the developer's floor plan is going to be. You yeah. Know I mean? Oh, well, okay. Understood. But there would be a big difference between a huge picture window oh, and yeah. a little, you know, bathroom window <laughs> looking out over the yard, right? Like that would be a different mm. outcome. And if you chose to put your dining room in a room with little teeny windows, great. But you, that might influence the design in the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. One more in the back. I have a question that doesn't relate to this, but I think since it's a small group, it's appropriate. And that is the zoning for the traffic that you said, the CEQA uh, traffic study. Will that be made public? 
and what is the criteria, if I could just leave that. Yes, it will be made public. Um, by criteria, the, what they'll do is they'll they'll look at what the implication is for these increased densities at these various places and what that might mean for uh, vehicle miles traveled. So how many additional trips, how many additional trips might happen because where there's one dwelling unit now, we're proposing potentially 10. So that's that many more trips to school, to work, to shopping. And so the CEQA would look at that and it will definitely be public. So the, um, the, the couple of things that I see missing in these examples, uh, you're going to have quite a bit of public space. You're going to have stairwells and hallways and stuff that, you know, great. It's going to be substantial. And the other thing is, I think the parking's inadequate, particularly because you got to have guest parking. My question, one question would be, Yes, parking, I presume, could be allowed in the setbacks, just like accessory buildings are, correct? And and like the single family does now. Yeah. Right. So you could have guest parking in the front of that building, for example, X number of parking spaces, and still have your garages in the back. Right. You might want to put it on the side. We typically don't put parking lots in front of the building between the building and the street we try it to get, look too commercial right or just doesn't look like a residential building but there's a lot of places beside that building on either side or in back for surface parking for guests right or additional covered parking so the i guess what i'm saying is that you might have to go your far may have to go a little higher than than three thirty uh, percent to allow for all the connectivity that's required. Then the other thing I'd bring up, this is an ideal lot. You know, you get a, a lot that's 205 feet or whatever it is on the side, perfectly square. And in reality, we got all kinds of crazy lots in this town. For example, uh, R1A is supposed to have 175 foot frontage. I found over a hundred properties in Atherton in the R1A zone that have less than 175 foot frontage. Um, the Oakwood prop property that, that they're talking about is, is a bizarre shape. And so that's going to be the biggest obstacle you have. Even our side setbacks uh, are on a sliding scale based on uh, the width of the lot. So I'd say that's the biggest that's going to be a problem um, when you're considering opportunity. Right. So if I can just respond to one, one thing you said, um, except for the Oakwood parcel, um, mo the parcels we've been asked to look at are generally about this type of shape. We're not developing standards for the whole town. The setback um is it possible for design standards to be more aggressive on a setback than the current r1a uh that you're using to model here first question just like i realize it wouldn't be a solve for the scenario you're worried about but i'm concerned about it in ours and is there a way, so that's first question. And then I have a second comment. I just, I want to reiterate that from what, what I've heard from you tonight is that you would trade a smaller front setback for a larger rear setback and effectively trying to make sure that all of the amenities and activities associated with multifamily is located away from adjacent single family neighbors or if it's closer it's low and on the ground level and under the fence and so forth as opposed to you know up where it's in view of the adjacent properties but yes thank you for a good read on my general <laughs> commentary 
I think my second question is it's great to see the modeling of the units themselves. But one of the things that I'm very curious about would be the modeling of the view from adjacent properties. Um, for example, in um, example, like the one on the screen here today, what does that look like from the center of the adjacent property, um, given that there's an eight foot fence around most of these places today, like just generally modeling that and at, at a 50 foot setback, how much of the backyard, you know, of the neighbors does that window, uh, you know, afford a view to? And is it possible to build that kind of a representation? to accommodate these. Right, were you at the study session? I'm sorry, I was not. That's okay. Um, one of the things we discussed there is the ability of landscaping, trees and bushes to help with the screening. Um, and we showed a photo of a before and an after in a single family condition. Um, the view was from ground level. It wasn't from upper and it wasn't from incoming. Um, there's only so much we can do with modeling all the potential views, but we do, we have experience writing standards for what you do with upper level balconies and windows that face onto X, whether it's another building, um, an exterior pool or, or some sort of outdoor space. There's only so much you can do, but I think what we're gonna explore is using some of the things Atherton already does, and that's like the landscape screening that they use between single family parcels. Yeah, I'll just reiterate the request. It would be great even in a generic example of a square lot with a square lot next to it. If you stand, you know, from the aspect of a person standing in the middle of that yard, looking over at a two-story, a three-story or a four-story building, you know, at these relative mm -hmm. heights that you modeled here, what's that view look like? How much is the window completely in view? Is it, you know, partially obscured by fencing or the garage that you put in there or whatever? Mm -hmm. I just love to see that. So when you were talking about the parking on the front and how it doesn't tend to be done because it doesn't look residential, it, it, it does bring up this maybe dynamic tension between what, the people who might live, want to buy or live in this place, the developer who may want to build it and how much they want to charge for it and sell it and the single family properties adjoining, right? So how are you guys going to achieve that so that it keeps the, I mean, the neighborhood in general, right? We also want it to look good as we drive by and, and reflect well on the town and the neighborhood from the front, but there's obviously a lot of implications for the people on the rear. So that sounds like it's going to be challenging, but I do think there could be probably creative ways to approach it going in with that knowledge that we want to lessen the impact. I'm going to Jane. Right, I don't please. know if I'm completely following your point, but I think what you're talking about is couldn't the parking be out in front as much as possible or, yeah, I mean, to I'll, keep it away right. from the neighbors. But aesthetically well done. Yeah, but aesthetically well done. Um, sure. Right. Or whatever functions we are talking about, um, stairways, entryways, um, places where people are moving around driveways, you know, all this. Is it possible to, for the standards to have, um, specifications about things like swimming pools, pickleball courts, basketball, like any of the outdoor loud things in the standards is. Are those under consideration? Sorry, I just, I want to make sure that for the purposes of recording, that's clear. Yes, that would fall under objective standards. Um, and the town actually has standards for outdoor sports courts um, and a number of another amenities that they already apply to residential districts. So, right. So we could use the existing standards. Those are the standards we don't want on any new multifamily. Okay. So no sports courts, no swimming pools, no balconies. No, we want underground parking, parking right in the front. If 
and go right in. We don't need anybody driving down the sides of our homes. Exhaust from 22 cars outside my bedroom window. No, thank you. I think I would basically concur with that and say that in any of these properties, we should be looking to put in standards that limit the impact, certainly in terms of noise, definitely in terms of car po you know, pollution and things um, as much as we could. We have someone who's been waiting in the back. Oh, are you <laughs> I would like to know why Oakwood wasn't used as your model, since that's the only property listed as a multifamily zoning in Atherton on their um, element that they have certified themselves. Why didn't we use that property instead of using all these properties that these people have been told it's only for CEQA review. It's not on the element. It possibly won't be on the element. Oakwood is on Atherton's own certified element. Why wouldn't you use that property? to develop these standards. How about if I could give you a good answer? Um, the City Council Planning Commission study session is still open. They continued it and they were starting to talk about height limits and such on the Oakwood site. So we decided to stay away from that, and let them finish their discussion. And that's just my answer. I can I completely understand that you don't like it, but that's just my answer. So. And also, as I tried to point out, the is in this still up for discussion, just like Oakwood is this sure. property that you're using. You, you can make a comment on Oakwood if you want to. We'll record your comments. Oh, I've I've been making them for two years. Yeah, there's plenty of recording. Why was Oakwood not? Why because was we, well, one reason is we were exploring the large house typology, and that wasn't really being looked at on the Oakwood, partly because of the side setbacks. I think that we were looking for multifamily, right? And Oakwood is the only multifamily. How, how about if I finish answering him? So, and then the other reason is that the study session is still open, if you will. They're still discussing it, but we just made a decision. Oakwood is one parcel. And there's all these other parcels that we're looking at this one typology we wanted to make use of tonight because it was scheduled. So we started looking at it. I understand that it doesn't fit the exact parameters of the shape, the setbacks that are different for Oakwood, but we, we felt like we could address a lot of the other sites with this one issue of the, the large house typology. So those Can are the two reasons. Can you clarify your comments about why Oakwood wasn't used? It's because why again? Because can the study I, session. Can I jump in here? Wait, no, you. Tom. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I understand this. At the study session, Oakwood was going a different way. They were starting to talk about Oakwood. They, and the planning commission and the and the city council that were having a discussion at the study session that I was at. They were having a discussion about Oakwood. They were having a discussion about the density bonus ordinance and what yeah. its effect could be on Oakwood, yeah. particularly with the height limit. There were a, a, more than two people that didn't remember allow, um, allowing a 40-foot 40 40, 40 foot height limit. So it's clear that the council and the planning commission want to revisit what the standards are for Oakwood. So we didn't want to start putting a big house Thank you. on Oakwood. I understand. I understand. Thank you. No, it's, so, so you run around. Um, the, the, these examples, several of them are three stories. Um, I have a feeling that uh, a lot of people would think that more lot coverage and better use of the buildable area, possibly expanding the building area, would be better than going three stories tall. I don't know what the pros and cons of that are, but um, just I think I think that's a really valuable comment that that the, maybe the setbacks can move if the building can. I, is that what you're saying that maybe if the setbacks were different, you could accommodate the same amount of development in a shorter building? 
Well, yeah, and, and there's been a lot of talk about it, but clearly walls can be higher. We could go to seven or eight foot walls. Windows can have requirements to be uh, an upstairs unit, five, five feet off the ground, for example, or be opaque. Uh, there could be all, or maybe if, if you get into a certain uh, setback, no windows at all on that side of the particular property, maybe skylights only for, for illumination, but for day, daytime illumination. But I just think if it's done right and these other things are factored in, I think most people would prefer a lower profile, even if it meant slightly smaller setbacks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In the back? Oh. As we look at the design criteria, one of the key things we're looking at is not how we can squeeze things in and make it taller or better or whatever. We're looking more at how we're going to protect the neighbors that live near it. So some of the things that Mr. Polito just brought up or some of the things that we're talking about, we're just Wednesday having the design standards discussion on we're going to review what we've come up with for ADUs, although there have been a lot of laws that have come back and have changed what we thought we could control to now we can't control it. And um, but also how some of these things that we'd like to see are going to be in the multifamily houses. So so these things are just under discussion starting Wednesday. Um, whether or not we can complete those Wednesday, just like the last meeting didn't get completed and is going to be continued to the 27th. Those are where design standards are coming into play. So, um, you know, planning group up here, you know, is working with us, but they can't. They don't know what the council may or may not approve. And so those things are still under discussion at this time. But, you know, from my point of view, we want to protect the neighbors. I don't know about the other council members. I can't speak for them, but I think that probably their hearts are in the same place. So no one likes this. Uh, we have to get this thing done. There have been other communities that have been like us that have said, well, you know, uh, as uh, some of the people that have spoken at meetings saying, why don't we slow roll it? Why don't we have no decision being a decision? Communities like Coronado was doing that. And Coronado recently got a letter from the attorney general that told them that, you will do this by this date and this by this date and this by this date, and you will get this thing done all by this date or the state will take over your planning function. And then we will be living with the state standards, which are not very atherton-ish. So, um, so we are trying to get this thing moved along, but at the same time, as I said, you know, considering the the residents that live around this area, that's why some of the homes uh, locations were picked that way. But but there still are people living around those, and we want to take them into consideration. So thanks. Well, thank you. Is there any? Uh... Uh, final comments, or we can um, call it a night. Well, if, especially if this was your first time here, thank you. It's great to continue to hear new voices, and the old voices are good to hear from you again, too. And so just, oh, let's go to the next one. Just to remind everybody, the next steps are the Monday after um, Thanksgiving at three o'clock, I believe. In this room will be the the study session will be continued. Oh, also virtually. Oh, and it's also going to be on virtual. 
uh, Zoom, I suppose. And then in January, we hope to have a draft. We're planning to have a draft that can be reviewed by the Planning Commission and um, the City Council. So thank you.